Um, so we're going to get going. Um, did we have an introduction slide? I can't remember. Sorry, this is going to be a little bit chaotic because there's two of us. Um, and I also didn't sleep a whole lot last night, and neither of us are caffeinated, particularly. Sorry. Okay, I'm just going to grab the mic. How's this? Awesome. Um, so what if you wanted to query all of OSM for all time? Um, yeah. For, for, ooh, hey, this is perfect. Yes. Awesome. What? <laughs> query all of it? All of it. For every change ever. What if you wanted to do it at scale? So what if you wanted to do it like, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I'm just we I'm, can alternate. I'm making jokes. Okay, cool. Um, so like, what if you wanted to do it like quickly and for lots of queries and things like that? And what if you wanted to do it really fast so that you could get answers in seconds, minutes, instead of weeks? So we needed this for different reasons. Um, I was working on a project for the Red Cross, the Missing Maps Leaderboards, and uh, we needed to backfill all of that data. And to do that, we needed analytics from the entire history of OSM. And one of the things that we measure there are the length of roads and the length of waterways and the number of buildings. And um, we need to know where those buildings are. So we actually need all the historical geometries of everything. And then you needed them for? Well, so um, I'm Rob Manuel. I work at Xavia, uh, and we uh, we develop an uh, open source project called GeoTrellis that deals with uh, raster data in Spark, but we also made it generic enough to deal with um, other types of data like point clouds. And so we wanted to move into um, being able to combine vector data with raster data, so it made, made sense for us to start implementing work on vector tiles. Um, you know, we were, we were looking for generic uh, uh, geospatial data, but what's the best uh, you know, vector data set out there that's open, it's open street map. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, uh, so we, yeah, we started, basically this worked like two years ago of trying to do um, vector tiles on Spark. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we approached it from different angles initially. Uh, I was working with uh, Joe Flasher at Amazon on the OSM public data set, and we could query that with Amazon Athena and get really quick answers to just raw OSM tabular data. Uh, and it, I discovered that you could actually do some really, 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 really crazy joins and SQL uh, to create those geometries and actually kind of measure them. Um, but it wasn't holding up when we actually tried to do it for the whole world. Um, and then these guys, meanwhile, uh, were taking a Spark approach uh, and taking OSM XML uh, and converting it through a process called vector pipe into vector tiles. Um, so we had a couple different a couple different angles. So yeah, the the realization was that actually you can use SQL or something that kind of looks like SQL, so like Spark or uh, or one of those tools uh, to process OSM data and get it into a form uh, where you can analyze it and produce other things. So this is an example of one of those just ridiculous queries. Um, it uses a lot of com uh, common table expressions. Uh, so like there's with ways, with expanded ways, with nodes, with yeah, anyway, it's kind of insanity. Um, so yeah, so um, we'd been collaborating together on some stuff with Open Aerial Map, uh, which is how I got my foot in the door on GeoTrellis and Spark. Uh, so we worked together to start this project called Osmesa, and it's called Osmesa because... So there's a uh, location tech project. Um, so GeoTrellis is, uh, is a location tech project. It's hosted at the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, there's another big data geospatial project called GeoMesa, um, and... We are, the, on the original designs, we were going to use GeoMesa based on HBase and S3 to store all historical geometries ever in a live database. Uh, and what we, what we realized after a little bit was that that wasn't cost effective and we were, it was just fast enough to just store them as these like org files in S3. Um, so OSMESA is a little bit of a misnomer now and people get really confused about how to pronounce it. OS so it's Mesa. like OSMESA, OSMESA, and it's like, I don't get, we're going to change it. So we need a new name. Uh, if anybody here, if we could just like mine the, the mines here, uh, if you have a good name, we're going to try to come up with one. Just shout out your examples at the end of the talk and we'll vote. So please come up with good ones. This is audience participation yeah. at its best. Um, so at its core, Osmesa is a set of Spark functions to churn through enormous quantities of weird data, looking at you, OSM, uh, and produce useful results quickly. So that's the derived data that can then be fed into things like the Jupyter Notebooks that Jennings has put together uh, to figure out uh, change over time. Um, and a lot of that re relies on having all of this detail. So doesn't that already exist? Uh, kind of? 
Kind of, kind of, yeah, not really. Um, it's not off the shelf. Um, there are a lot of like little individual pieces. You can wire Osmosis together with Osmium, together with some Python, together with some other things. Um, you can plug it into Postgres, and then you actually run it, and it'll take days to weeks to months. Uh, and it's not horizontally scalable. Everything is intended to run in memory. Um, so if you want to get this stuff to work really well, you do what Jennings did, and you get the NSF to lend you a machine with 48 cores and half a terabyte of memory. Um, I can't do that. My laptop only has 16. Um, so what we want to do is we want to we want to actually we want to process history. We want to be able to split it into pieces and scale that out across large clusters. Um, and also, as far as all of these existing tools and everything, uh, history breaks everything. As soon as you start dealing with history, not only are you dealing with the current state of the world, but all possible previous states of the world going back to 2007. Um, and it's kind of insane, and nothing except for some code that Jennings and I have written uh, will actually handle geometries for that. Uh, overpass kind of will, but it's all based on time slices uh, rather than figuring out what individual versions of things existed. So for now, Osmesa is working for us. Um, it's definitely not an off-the-shelf tool yet, so <laughs> I guess we don't check that one yet. Um, but it's definitely, it's. Uh, it was really effective at backfilling the missing maps leaderboards. We're generating vector tiles off of it. We're generating real time generating real time summary statistics with lengths of things and areas and stuff, and it's and it's being great. So, um, if you have one of these things like where you want to be able to work with the full history, this may be useful to you. If you already have a Spark based workflow, uh, if you're already working on Hadoop clusters and things like that, um, it might actually be a really good fit. You want to take over for a bit? Oh, sure. Um, so one of the goals uh, for this development was to facilitate rapid um, concept iteration. So what that what that means is um, to you know be, when working with these really large data sets, it's kind of okay if you're just like, ah, who cares? It takes a, it's a two day process. I don't, I'll do it over the weekend, whatever. But if you look at the results and you get an idea and you say, okay, well now I want to ask this different question you have to go through another whole two days, right? So we're trying to take that, that, that uh, question to answer time uh, for these very, very large questions down to you know, hours instead of, instead of days. Yeah, so the Athena stuff, it reduces the time to first question so you don't have to do all the processing. And this actually allows you to do, well, not import processing, but derivative processing. So these are the useful derivatives. So these are the geometries of the world. This is the 600 gig file that contains geometries for every version and minor version. In OSM, it's also the summary statistics. Uh, it's the CSVs that you can pull into other things and have data, data science, um, do data science on. Um, and yeah, the other goal is just to enable inconceivable things. There are a lot of things that we don't even try and imagine because we can't figure out how to get, take the intermediate steps to get there. So the, the first step there is to make it quick to actually get these things so you can iterate quickly. But then once you've got these interesting derivatives that were really, really, really expensive to process, can you produce other derivatives on top of that that are just really interesting? Uh, and a lot of this comes from or is enabled by compatibility with off-the-shelf tools like GeoTrellis and Spark. Yeah, so one of the things that, um, you know, I, I come from the big data world and the, and the geospatial world, so we, there's this whole stack of, of processes that, has, that does have like a pretty high learning curve to like get into. Um, I saw that uh, with Seth when you were first like getting into Spark, there, you know, it was like, okay, I guess I have to learn how to code Scala now. And so you learn that and you learn Spark and it was like, wow, it's, it was impressive the, the pace at which you learn it, but it's like also impressive of how much you have to kind of onboard to get into this ecosystem. But once you're there, there's just this set of tools that have solved all of these big data processing techniques that are really applicable to this large data set. Um, so we're able to apply them and we're currently working on trying to figure out how to make that uh, even more accessible through Python interfaces and, and, and other ways. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so um, it's kind of the, the unholy union of the uh, bespoke tools and things that fit OSM really well, like the OSM PBF format is genius. Um, it makes storage of that stuff really small. Uh, but what understands it? Tools in the OSM ecosystem. Um, by turning it into ORC, it gets a bit bigger, um, but it immediately gets understood by everything else within that world. 
Um, so you can start doing you can start doing more with things that don't even know what that OSM is a thing. Um, and then there's also the OGC data model, so points, polygons, lines. Um, that's totally different from nodes, ways, and relations. Uh, if we can bridge that, there are benefits to both. Um, there are some really, really, really useful things about the OSM data model, uh, but JTS doesn't know how to measure a relation. So here's here's a diagram of the like kind of general workflow. And so we've been saying Spark a bunch. Just for those of you who are not familiar with that technology, uh, Apache Spark is a distributed computation engine uh, that came out of um, labs at, the UC, at UC Berkeley, uh, I think in 2009. Um, but if you ever heard of Hadoop as like a big data processing engine, Spark is kind of the next generation of that. Um, uh, yeah, it's widely used in in uh, in the whole open source ecosystem by large corporations, et cetera, uh, for doing this type of you know big data processing. You sort of state your problem. You say, I want to get this information out of this large data set, and then you hand it off to Spark, and it um, it distributes the work over a cluster, pulls in the data it needs, shuffles data around uh, efficiently, and gives you answers. Uh, but Spark doesn't speak geospatial. It doesn't know what a raster is or, or, or a line string is, right? Uh, so that's what GeoTrellis provides to Spark, is the ability to understand and be able to manipulate uh, geospatial data. So we have, uh, so when we modified GeoTrellis to work with, uh, with the ORC files and, be, and then, so a lot of Seth's code to like tie together all the, geomet uh, all the geometries out of the OSM data model, right? That's what, uh, that's what Osmesa is doing. And so we run it on a AWS EMR cluster. You don't have to run it there. You can run it wherever Spark runs. Uh, but then we produce uh, downstream products like uh, various statistics like the missing maps leaderboard, like how do you compute how many things have been edited by this uh, one campaign. Even if those things have been deleted, you want to still count them as, um, you know, as an edit, so you can't just use the snapshot, right? So statistics like that, uh, global vector tiles. So for instance, um, the, uh, the Urchin app application that um, we saw Derek present on yesterday, um, the vector tiles that ha contain a subset of historical data uh, and contain all of the features are produced by Osmesa. Uh, and then also you can produce other ORC files that kind of feed back into the process. So yeah. Um, so a neat, a, neat effect, a neat side effect of this has been an exchange of ideas. Um, so me being new to the Scala and Spark ecosystem and learning GeoTrellis, but being familiar with how OSM works, and Rob being really familiar with GeoTrellis and Spark and Scala. Um, and also like extending that to uh, working with the JTS developers and figuring out what we can take from the OSM data model for geometries and feed back into JTS uh, for more efficient storage of geometries for better support for topology and stuff like that. So that's been really fun. Um, so the differentiators of us Mesa over these other systems are that it's Spark based. So pro and con. Um, it defaults to history, so it means that we're tackling the hard problems first. Um, you don't have to use it for history, so things get more efficient if you're not. Um, and it handles relations. Um, a lot of these things are just like ways are relatively easy to assemble. Relations are not, uh, particularly once you get into relations that refer to relations that refer to relations. Um, so we're, we're tackling that head on. We've got a bunch of that stuff working. Recursive relations, not yet. Turn restrictions, not yet. 3D buildings, almost there. Uh, bus routes, yes. Um, multi polygons, yes. Uh, we also uh, assume the presence of change sets for enrichment. So we keep a core set of metadata, including the change set ID, but we don't think about any of the user information. Partially GDPR is to blame, um, but all of that data is available as a second table. So in SQL terms, it's a join. Um, yeah, so things that are hard, history and relations. Um, so w we all know and love the OSM data model. Um, I personally actually do love it. Um, I think it's pretty great. Um, and yeah, so these, sorry, recycling a little bit. Um, you guys know what change sets are. Change sets are these non-atomic things um, that are really useful for conceptually grouping edits together. Uh, the problem is that they can overlap with one another, so things get a little bit chaotic. Uh, but by thinking in terms of change sets, uh, it means that any edits uh, that occur within a change set to an individual way only get chunked out to a single uh, geometry change. So we have the notion of minor versions. Uh, which is if you create a way, it refers to a bunch of nodes. If you move any of those nodes, it actually changes the geometry of the way. Um, sorry, I'm 
yeah, <laughs> I'm doing this. I, I jumped ahead a little bit. Um, so we're moving uh, the node on the right-hand side. Uh, and uh, the way is still at version one, um, but the geometry is totally different. So it is a distinct thing. Um, so what we do is we actually say, this is a minor version change. Uh, and we bump the version of the way. Um, so it ends up being 1.1. So um, when processing boundary relations, there end up being about 6,000 versions and minor versions of Germany, uh, which produces all sorts of all sorts of problems. Um, the other thing we do is we convert timestamp into an additional an, addi an initial update date uh, that propagates out to the minor versions. Um, so there's the timestamp of the minor version that is actually the timestamp of the node that moved. Uh, we also added a valid until, um, which is for uh, so you can figure out what the validity window is of a particular feature until it's been replaced by another version or a minor version, which means that we can then poke a hole through the whole thing and say, what did OSM look like on September 7th, 2008? Um, and we can see exactly what it looked like at that time. Um, so yeah, so uh, to do this, we bake work files that have geometries of every element. So that goes from about an 80 gig version of the OSM PBF uh, to, at the moment, about 600 gig. Uh, and a lot of that is like things like Germany, um, but it's also just the proliferation of minor versions, uh, particularly as they roll up to relations. Uh, and then we can do uh, statistics, and again, by thinking in change sets, uh, it, it brings the problem down so we're not doing change sets per geometry, because that's a few billion. Um, so the, the cool thing about this is that you can process the full history into geometries, not as vector tiles yet. Um, that's, a, that's a derivative process, but into the core 600 gig file in under 40 minutes um, on a big cluster. And it costs about, actually it's probably about $75 now um, because it supports more uh, types of relations and that takes a little bit longer. Um, so it's yeah, and we're also trying to figure out how to uh, build update mechanisms in to avoid refreshing the entire data set. So you can take a snapshot from two weeks ago and then apply all of the minutely diffs and bring it up to date uh, without having to reprocess the bulk of it. And a lot of that kind of thinks about, um, Rob's taught me a lot about partitioning. So partition partitioning by time, if we were to do a vector tile set, we would probably actually partition it by month. Um, so 2007, uh, would have its own vector tile set, or like August 2007 would have its own vector tile set, and uh, we could then just leave it there once it's done, and then just work on now. And if we needed to pre-process the whole thing, we could, uh, but we wouldn't have to, and it would stay cheaper and faster and everything like that. Oh, yeah. Um, some data created by Ask Mesa. Um, this is uh, of an animation of editing behavior in Detroit. Um, so I did a little bit of this um, last week. So the, the darker or the lighter areas, the, the areas that are, that are popping out are uh, routes. Uh, and you can just see the geometry is changing over time. Um, you can pick a particular time in this. We'll post these slides and you can uh, follow through on the links. Um, hashtags, do you want to talk about this? Yeah, so this was uh, just a, a, a heat map uh, uh, using a, a Mapbox GL of all of the nodes that were ever created or deleted or edited by a, uh, a hashtag in, in the right. It's a little out of date now, but at the time it was just like this big spark job that looked at the history and then just dumped vector tiles of historical point data that you could render as heat maps. And it's just really cool to see the impact of a hashtag uh, from the global map and be able to zoom in and see the individual node edits. Uh, this is also um, a, a demonstration of uh, GeoTrellis combining uh, vector data and raster data. So we took SRTM, which is a global uh, elevation data set at 30 meters, so pretty large elevation data set. We combined that with um, OSM to uh, with the water boundaries and also roadways and rasterized that into the elevation data and did what's called a Tobler um, calculation to create, a, uh, to create a friction surface. And what a friction surface does is it allows you to do cost distance analysis. So saying, if I start here, uh, not based on the road ne network, based on just raster data, um, how fast can I get to other, any other place around me? Right? And that's, uh, that's good for doing um, sort of uh, you know, timing, uh, like route timing, if you don't actually have a route, you just have a raster, you're going over terrain, how difficult it is to cross this terrain, right? So we're doing these global jobs that take in raster data, uh, vector data, and, and creating these derivative products. 
Um, I've got a couple of observable notebooks. So observablehq.com slash at Majadna. Um, so this is full history for Detroit. You can look at it at particular points in time, filter it. You can also fork it and add additional features if you want to see stuff. Uh, we've got user contributor heat sorry, contributor heat maps. Um, so uh, this also is similar to the hashtag, so you can see what editing behavior looks like. Uh, we've got those for Detroit updating minutely. Um, yeah, so then there are also a few other use cases that uh, Rob's been working on at Azavia and other folks there. Um, so building matching uh, between OSM and other vector data sets uh, to do conflation and understand how things have changed and then urchin, so uh, applying it, combining it with raster data uh, to see what's changed. Um, we want to talk about, uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so a little bit about uh, the future of where this, I think this could be applied to. There's validation workflows, um, you know, identifying uh, who are the mappers that we should be, um, uh, you know, identifying as experienced mappers that can actually be connected to uh, less experienced mappers, right? Understanding editing history, uh, understanding like where edits are happening. There's so much uh, data that could happen that, that actually uh, helps out a validation workflow, you know, kind of also validating as in, you know, uh, understanding nefarious, you know, edits in the map, right? How do we, how do we do this? If you have the whole view of history and you're doing statistics on it, you, you sort of have this uh, ability to to compute that. And then another thing that we're really excited about um, is uh, machine, machine learning pre and post processing, right? So development in seed has a great tool, Label Maker, um, that works on a single machine. How do we make a distributed version of that? Uh, work, we're working on that very soon. We're releasing a, a project called Raster Vision, which is around doing deep learning on satellite imagery that's being released this month. Check it out. Um, but we're, the next step there is to make it pull in vector tiles as labeled data uh, that'll be generated by, by OS Mesa. Um, yeah, and we're at time, so thank you. So real quickly, what's the new name? Yes. OSM Firehose. OSM Firehose. We got Firehose. We got OSM Wayback Machine. I think Jennings that's, has a trademark on that, but uh, we might be able to merge. Hot Tub Time Machine. Fire hose them. <laughs> what do you got? Sorcery. Sorcery. OSM sorcery. OSM sorcery. All right. Any others? All right. We got sorcery. We got fire. Fire hose them. And not the Wayback Machine because that's taken. The node back, the node back machine. Node back machine. Yeah. All right. Out of, out of fire. <laughs> Are we going to take either one of these? I like sorcery. That's, that's a good one. What do you, what do you guys think? Clap if, it's, uh, clap if it's sorcery. All right. All right. All right. It's fun. Uh, clap uh, if it's fire hosm. All right. So, so the crowd said, what, what, what can we do? What can we do? <laughs> um, so, so now that you've, you've set our futures, um, do you guys have any questions real quick? We'll take like one or two. Martijn. Yeah, so, so really what we want to do is, is uh, be able to post-process uh, machine learning output. So we just want to see what's in OSM uh, that we've already kind of predicted. Um, so it's, it's not the conflation mechanism, it's not the merge part of conflation, it's just the matching. So we just came up with a distributed matching algorithm that, that, that does that. Also, also, it's good for if you have like other large vector data sets that you're trying to compare to OSM, you can see what's in OSM and not in that vector data set or what's in that vector data set and not. Yep. Well, I try and put everything in the vector tiles. <laughs> Um, because part of it is that we're assuming that uh, the vector tiles are being consumed by other processes rather than by people on mobile devices. Um, so, yeah, I try and wedge all of the geometries in there, all of the tags that exist for that version of it, uh, and then some additional metadata like valid intel. Yeah, Mapbox has like a recommended size of a vector tile. We're, we're just like, we're like 10 never, never mind. Yeah. yeah, so it's like, it's like there's dis what I call like display vector tiles or cartographic vector tiles, right, that have like everything laid out really nicely for map rendering. And then we're working with analytic, analytic vector tiles that uh, contain analytic data that we actually consume in different ways. And you can visualize them. It's pretty easy to do it. Uh, but they're like tend to be larger and contain a lot more information. I 
I don't. Are, and the question is, uh, now that the people have spoken, are we really going to call it fire? Fire ho uh, or fire hosum. Fire hosum. 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 Um, maybe. All right. <laughs> uh, no, that's one of the that's one of the reasons that we originally wanted to pull it into GeoMesa. Uh, GeoMesa has a Z curve based uh, spatial index in it that we could then query more efficiently. Um, we've thought about this a bunch, but actually have totally punted on the problem because. Spark lets us iterate through things reasonably well. Yeah, it's it's much it's much more complicated than Zcurve. I'll just put a caveat that like GeoMesa has solved the like uh, GeoMesa GWave GeoTrails also does a lot of this so solving the sort of space filling curve based um, distributed indexing. Uh, but we, yeah, we don't contain any like R trees or any sort of like static uh, indexing. I think that's maybe what Atlas is doing, right? No. no. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the vector tiles are in 3857, so they're in Web Mercator. Um, the org file, uh, all the geometries, well, they're serialized as WKB, um, but they're in just geographic coordinates. Yeah, yeah. So this is a big part of the uh, the public data sets philosophy. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Well, I'm just going to say that like the original thing was let's put AWS, it into GeoMesa. AWS. What's that? AWS, AWS. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we put it into GeoMesa uh, backed by HBase, we can then share those objects out to somebody else. Somebody could plug into that instance of HBase and not have to do any of the processing and just read only immediately. Um, so we want to be able to process this stuff once, share it out in some way. Um, and then have other people either be able to query it where somebody's supporting it, but then if people are using it lots, um, they can create their own copy of it very, very, very easily uh, without having to do any processing. So it's just a matter of copying a file or a set of files and maybe spinning up a cluster somewhere, but just like little teeny thing. Who's our next speaker? Is it, do we have one? Because I'm happy to keep thinking. Oh. That's right. OSM Man X isn't here. Jeff Boeing is has other. Okay. So this just opened up. <laughs> what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> I don't. I don't have permission to do that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. So feel free to leave. We're just going to show the demos that we skipped over because they're kind of fun to look at. Um, sorry, this this is not really all that visible. <laughs> not this one. Yeah, sorry. It's it's that there's all this really. I'm going to describe what's happening. Um, so, someone here. I don't know your name. Um, you're awesome. You mapped Disneyland in incredible detail. Um, this is the process that by which Disneyland got mapped. Um, yeah, it's it's well, amazing. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess it's starting to become visible now. Um, so uh, this is a, I can't remember if this is Tangram or Mapbox GL based. Um, what it does is it loads the Zoom 15 uh, vector tiles with full history and then sticks the point in it and then just like goes a day forward at a time um, to do the animation. Um, so you can see as, uh, in this case, bus routes get added, but as parking lots get added, parking aisles, um, all the details, trash cans and stuff like that. Um, it's just like, it's it's ridiculous, it's insane. Um, there's a, yeah, um, when we post the slides, there's gonna be a link to another one. Um, so that's that's what the, uh, the animation was in the slides. That was the same thing for Detroit. Um, so we can we can generate this for extracts, and if you want to see how your own city was mapped over time, um, we can put an animation together actually pretty quickly. I'm just gonna show the hashtag one because I really like it. Oh yeah. Again, now we're just we're just playing, so feel free to just get up or throw things at us or whatever. Um, yeah. So for all all of missing maps ever, uh, at a certain point, whenever I ran this. Here are all the nodes um, that were either added or modified or deleted. And what I like to do here is bring up examples of, and you can see how like heavy the vector tiles are because they're taking 
um, while the load. But this base map is also based on OpenStreetMap, so you can see nodes that were added, but then must have been deleted or like otherwise not included in this base map, um, which I find really interesting. Like clearly there was a building here. Did that get deleted? What happened to it? Um, it got validated out. Uh, yeah. And so there's yeah you know, we can compute this for for any um, any of the uh, the hashtags that we want. Uh, and then just for the scale of the raster one, we can see like the level of detail of, um, you know, you can see this, this sort of mountain ridge. And again, this is a cost, uh, this is a um, friction surface, so it looks a little weird, but basically the darker uh, places are harder to cross over. And then you can see the level of detail, and this was generated for um, the, entire, the entire globe. Um, so this process, this job took, you know, several hours to run on a large cluster, but uh, yeah, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen a, a global um, uh, data set off of SRTM uh, put out like this that was computed as, as, uh, as quickly, so. Yes, yeah. So we have other demos when, when things are running with like GeoPySpark notebooks that we put, we put dots and then it calculates the cost distance uh, across any of these two points, yeah. Yes? Uh, not, I mean, it's just ro to run the job again. And then if uh, a little bit extra effort is to just keep it up to date, which we already have uh, streaming mechanisms, so we kind of like skated over that part. But like, so we bake, we bake vect like global vector tile sets, and then we don't want to do that every hour, right? Because that'll cost a lot. Uh, so we do them like basically weekly, and then, uh, or we have the capability to do them weekly, and then like uh, have streaming processes that, based off of change sets, will update it. Um, yeah, we've gotten to the point where the part that sucks isn't actually generating the data; it's putting it to S3. So we want to do that infrequently or find ways to uh, combine a whole bunch of tiles together. Yeah, I, I need to send you a draft of a blog post. Um, Mapsen produced a thing called uh, Topplecoddle, uh, which is a meta tile server. Um, so if you say, I want this tile, it'll be like, oh, that's along with these other tiles in a zip archive. Let's just download that and serve these things up. Um, so you end up with uh, the math I did for a sorry for a meta tile size of eight, so eight on a side, so 64 tiles at the zoom. It takes one sixty-fourth um, the number of files. So when you're talking one and a half billion, um, it's a lot lower. So we're trying to figure out how to actually like get this stuff a little bit more standardized uh, and output it from Osmesa and get it consumed by other tools. Does Does anybody know uh, what cloud optimized geotiffs are? A different crowd. Um, yeah. So there's <laughs> there's this uh, there's this effort with uh, raster data to try to make cloud optimized versions of it, where you just have these big raster datas, uh, big raster data on uh, object store like S3, um, and you can read out all just the chunks of it that you want. So that way we don't have to download these big files anymore. We can just use tools that uh, can pull just the data it needs. So what Seth is talking about is basically cloud optimized geotiffs for vector tiles. Right? We want to be able to store these large chunks, pyramided chunks of vector tiles just as single files and then have the uh, capability to just take out the pieces that we want and read out individual tiles. So you're going to have like a, a two gig zip file uh, and if you want a single tile out of it, um, you make two reads to it and you read half a meg out of the whole zip file. All right. Any other ones? You want to hear my stand-up? Tell, no. tell us stuff. Oh, yeah. No, I want to hear your stand-up. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just oh, kidding. damn. That was it. All right. Well, thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Cheers.